A very good evening to all. Uh, I, Dr. Sachin Shinde, a medical advisor for Respira Division from Lupin team, welcome you all for the today's webinar of pulmonary fibrosis. Air for the rare. For the today's webinar, we have esteemed faculty, Dr. Sanju Mehta sir as a moderator. He will give us a short brief intro of pulmonary fibrosis and ILD. After that, Dr. Arjun will talk about the diagnostic challenges in the ILD, followed by IPF and PF ILD through the lens of radiologist by Dr. Samarjit sir. Uh, Dr. Nitin Abhyankar sir will talk about the new paradigm in the management of fibrosis in lung diseases. And after that, there will be the panel discussions and by the moderator. So uh, the, for that, we have uh, the extreme faculty as a moderator, Dr. Sanju Mehta sir, he is IMD FCCP, founder life, it is Lung India Foundation and specialist in chest allergy, sleep medicine, Lilawati and Aruginidhi Hospital, Mumbai. Uh, Dr. Uh, P. Arjun is a senior consultant and the group coordinator at the Department of Respiratory Medicine, Kim's Health, Trivendram. Dr. Nitin Abhyankar sir is an MD and ERS diplomat in the depa uh, Department of Pulmonology Medicine. He is a course coordinator of respiratory uh, in Pune Hospital Research Center, Pune. Dr. Samarjit sir is a MD and senior consultant radiologist in the Department of CT MRI, Sri Gangaram Hospital, New Delhi. Uh, Dear faculty and dear uh, all participants, we know that uh, today's pandemic era, the <coughs> expert opinion and the clinical expertise has a significant role, particularly for the new hypothesis gener generations. And on the basis of that, uh, we can further uh, elongate it in clinical trial. After that, the clinical review, meta-analysis, and the guideline. The considering the today's scenario, the expert opinion with the today's faculty, uh, find we uh, a new hope in the lung fibrosis, particularly because of the COVID. Uh, so, uh, with that brief introductions, uh, I would. Uh, it's my privilege to hand over the sessions to Dr. Sanju Mehta sir for further introductions. So, over to you, sir. Hello. Hi. Good evening. Uh, first of all, welcome everybody. Uh, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to my dear friends in the faculty panel. Uh, I'd like to welcome my very good friends in Lopin. And above all, uh, all the delegates who have chosen to log in today. Uh, we have a very fascinating program. Um, I think what challenges every chess specialist anywhere in the world and I think what makes you a good chess specialist is how you get your head around diagnosing and treating the most complicated thing, which is interstitial lung disease. And that's the focus of today's program. Uh, I'm very um, fortunate to have a wonderful faculty, and I think I will introduce them uh, one by one. And uh, when as I go along, why don't I do one thing? Um, I'm going to talk, I'll introduce a subject. And then as we come to each speaker, I'll introduce each speaker. Actually, most of the introduction has already been done by Dr. Shinde. So that has worked very well. Uh, let me share my screen and then we'll go. And of course, I want to thank Lupin uh, above all and Respira Division Lupin for supporting this educational activity and for making it happen. I think we are at the cusp of something very exciting. So let's start by... Looking at today's program, so I'm going to start with respiratory bronchial into the alveolar ducts and alveolar sacs. This area is where gas exchange will take place. And this is the interstitium. This is the air. And this is where there is the blood vessels. So interstitial lung disease really relates to damage that happens within and around the interstitium, though there are many conditions that can may not directly affect the interstitium, but one thing is there, all of them affect gas exchange. By and large, many of them are progressive. They affect gas exchange, and that's why they are bunched together uh, into this diagnosis of interstitial lung disease. 
um, and there can be a variety of issues. We're going to walk you through that. So what are these interstitial lung diseases? And we've known them for over 120 years now, that there are a variety of these conditions, um, starting through many, many uh, classifications. And the first real classification came in the 1960s when uh, the ATS tried to classify it as acute and subacute. And then it went through this pretty well-known classification in the 60s uh, when you got to see the nomenclature which you see today. And then 2002, 2013, and then this is roughly when it began to take the shape of the nomenclature that you see now. So, the challenge when you come to a patient who has interstitial lung disease, remember, all of them are not the same. And in fact, when I get a patient who has been uh, diagnosed as interstitial lung disease, at least in the city of Mumbai and in the areas that I practice, he will go on the net, come back to me and say, oh my God, doctor, I'm going to die because he thinks he has got IPF. And I tell him, you're suffering from acute, severe Googleitis because you've read Google. And the only thing that Google shows when you read ILD is IPF and they think they're going to die. That, however, is not the case. When a patient comes to you and has problems in the lung, you're going to have to deal with a bunch of conditions. First of all, we have to exclude conditions which have known causes such as occupation or drugs. And then the granulomatous diseases such as sarcoidosis, HP, berylliosis. Now, all of them have much better prognosis and because they have a known cause, they can be treated. Conditions which have a definite histological pattern. All of these are not that bad in terms of outcomes. And finally, and then we know what causes them. And finally, we have this group of idiopathic interstitial pneumonias, which are either called as, either fall into the IPF group or in the non-IPF group, which is NSIP, RBILD, DIP. And some of this has changed. Uh, but the important bug over here is IPF, which is about 55% of the uh, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. It's very interesting that India is one of the few countries that has got a registry of interstitial lung diseases and a fantastic registry done with, uh, out of uh, India, centered by, by the Indian Chess Society, which was the main center was in Jaipur. In our Indian context, probably IPF is only about 13%. We have other conditions that contribute 55% of our interstitial lung diseases are chronic HP, which is very interesting because we have a lot of toxins in our environment and uh, chronic HP has a large role to play. Then we have connective tissue diseases, which is another very large number of patients. And then, of course, you have this subgroup of patients. So I'm sure my speakers are going to talk about it, but I want you to realize that when we talk of interstitial lung disease, they are a heterogeneous bunch of diseases characterized by low oxygen, damage at the interstitium, but having very different outcomes, very different prognosis, very different causes. The question is, will they all have the same treatment? And I'm sure Dr. Abhyankar will address some of this today as we go along. There's a new classification and I'm not going to go into this because the rest of the speakers will do it. But remember, some go short term, some are progressive and long term resulting in transplantation. So this is a whole heterogeneous bunch of conditions. Now, <clears throat> because they all affect the lung, the diagnosis is very challenging. But because they have different outcomes, the specific diagnosis is essential in the management. So now I think I will end over here and I'm going to with this, I'm going to segue to my first speaker, who's going to tell us all about the diagnostic challenges in dealing with these interstitial lung disease. So with that, I'd like to welcome and introduce uh, Dr. Arjun. Dr. Arjun is a chief of pulmonary at Thiru Anantapuram. Is it called Thiru Anantapuram or Trivandrum Medical College? 
he has a special interest in a variety of uh, respiratory disorders such as sleep and uh, interstitial lung disease he has a bunch of publications i think at least 35 he's a speaker at national and international meetings so with those words i would like dr Sach- uh, dr arjun to please take over and uh, and start continue his proceedings uh with this so thank you sir thank you and thank you for the nice words of introduction uh is are my slides visible sir Yes, Dr. Arjun. It yeah. is. Yes, thank you. Yes. Uh, th- uh, let me thank Dr. Sanjay Mehta and, and Lupin for having given me this opportunity to speak in this uh, wonderful uh, webinar today on interstitial lung disease. I have been tasked to talk about the diagnostic challenges in interstitial lung disease. Dr. Mehta has given us a wonderful introduction of the topic of interstitial lung disease. And as he has already alluded to, Interstitial lung diseases are a heterogeneous group of pulmonary disorders, which are characterized by, uh, they have a clinically similar presentation of cough, breathlessness. Dr. Mehta has given us a wonderful introduction physiologically by the topic of, of lung volumes lung and impaired oxygenation and is very important. As he has already alluded, radiologically, interstitial lung diseases are a heterogeneous group of pulmonary disorders, when you which look, are characterized, uh, are, uh, by, characterized by distortion uh, of the gas exchange They have a clinically similar unit. presentation, but of cough, apart from all these similarities, they all differ as Dr. physiologically by restriction of lung volumes and impaired oxygenation is very important. Radiologically, all of them have been diffused lung infiltrates. And no, this is the latest classification, classification of they are ILV as per the distortion of the gas exchange group. units. You have by interstitial lung disease. Apart from all the similarities, they are all pneumonia, autoimmune, uh, in the uh, interstitial lung diseases, they, uh, and also pneumonia in the response and other ILVs. Um, that they show to and the in the in that idiopathic interstitial pneumonia, you have a. No, this is the latest classification starting from ILV and most common one is ER as we see you have interstitial lung disease classified into the idiopathic interstitial pneumonia along through autoimmune SIP. When we 
talk about the clinical parameters perhaps the most important one and one which never has to be overlooked is the history a properly taken history can give us good clues as what could be the cause for interstitial lung disease in the given patient review of other systems are also very important because many of them have extra pulmonary uh, from uh, symptoms and complaints you also have to specifically look into the smoking status the hobbies the medication list occupation exposure history and even a family history for instance even the age and gender are important if we have a 70 year old ex smoker who presents with breathlessness um, ex smoking male then the first and you diagnose ild the most probable um, cause for ild in him would be idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis on the other hand if you have a 40 year old lady who has come to you and you make a diagnosis of ild it is most likely that she might be suffering from connective tissue disorder um, as a possible cause for her interstitial lung disease the duration of symptoms again is important ipf usually has symptoms that ranges from months to years whereas others like sarcoid and connective tissue disease um, ctd ild and organizing pneumonias run a sub acute course for weeks to months and then you can have the acute um, um, interstitial lung disease like the acute interstitial pneumonia or the eosinophilic pneumonia or the acute hypersensitivity pneumonitis which can have an acute presentation so all these are important past medical history is important especially um, you have to ask for history of connective tissue disease and also look for other conditions like uh, inflammatory bowel disease any history of malignancy in the patient all this could give some clue medications are important it is very important to have a thorough drug history taken and there are some drugs which may really may overlook even for example when they give her patient has chronic uti and the patient is on repeated courses of nitrofurantoin it is one drug that we know is notorious to produce interstitial lung disease and anti cam chemotherapeutic agents are again a major group of drugs which are likely causes to um, likely to be the cause of interstitial lung disease which can produce drug induced ild smoking history is important some ilds uh, occur exclusively in smokers like lch bip rbi ild and even ipf whereas smoking is proposed to be protective in some kind to pr protect against development of some diseases like sarcoid and hsp and pulmonary hemorrhage is more common in patients who have good partial syndrome who continue to smoke family history is important you can have autosomal dominant inheritance in cases like ipf and tuberous sclerosis whereas other diseases like neiman pick gaucher's hermans kiput like show autosomal recessive inheritance so we have to ask whether anyone else in the family is suffering from any interstitial lung disease and it can be a big clue occupational and environmental exposures are important uh, not only to make a diagnosis of occupational lung disease but also for hypersensitivity pneumonitis so it's very important to have a detailed questioning of the present occupation past occupation all the occupations that the patient ever had to come to a diagnosis taking ipf as a prototype what are the clinical features that you usually expect in a patient who has idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis classically occurs in adults in the late middle age most of them have been current are either current smokers or have been smokers they present with progressive exertional dyspnea this finally becomes dyspnea at rest that is from progresses from mmrc grade 0 to 4 they usually have a non productive cough except during infections when they may have some product expectation but largely it is a non productive cough some things are important fever is uncommon constitutional symptoms are usually not prominent and very importantly extra pulmonary symptoms are usually absent in ipf so if you have a patient with interstitial lung disease and the patient has extra pulmonary symptoms you have to make a thorough search to know to find out the, uh, uh, the another etiology for that particular patient symptoms are important dyspnea and cough are the typical symptoms that you are associated with interstitial lung disease but there are some things which may give a clue to the possible cause for example if you have a patient with ild who has wheeze you might probably be dealing with church straws hp sarcoid or lymphangitis if the patient has hemoptysis and has ild perhaps you are thinking of pulmonary hemorrhage and hemorrhage syndromes like good pastures vaginals or lamb and the patient has chest pain you think of a disease which uh, ild which affects the pleura like sld rild mctd asbestosis or drug induced ild extra pulmonary symptoms are important and you should uh, make a thorough um, uh, questioning about them joint muscle symptoms look for ask for presence of raynaud's phenomenon ask for sicca symptoms ask whether there are any skin rash lesions and even eye abnormalities like uveitis scleritis or ulcers in the eye what are the clinical features of a patient with interstitial lung disease mostly in advanced cases you typically get rapid shallow breathing 
Clubbing is present in about 50% of patients. You get fine inspiratory crackles, initially, which is basin and which is called Velcro crackles. And over a period of time, as the disease progresses, you are able to um, appreciate crackles in almost the entire lung fields on both sides. Finally, the patients may develop respiratory failure with the cyanosis, and patient will have evidence of pulmonary artery hypertension and core pulmonary also. Other thing to be kept in mind is that many of these patients have exacerbations, which are known to happen during the natural history of the disease. And these are episodes of rapid decline in saturation with clinical and radiological evidence of worsening and usually happen within a span of four weeks. These are things that you have to look for, the extra pulmonary findings in systemic disease like erythema nodosum, the nail bed ulcers, um, the malar rash, and all this could give you valuable information as to the possible underlying um, uh, cause of interstitial lung disease. So what are the investigations that one has to do? Routine blood investigations are usually non-contributory. Uh, imaging is very important. You have to do a chest X-ray. Mostly you'll be able to find out some uh, lesions like some reticular opacities or reticular nodular lesions. Um, you have to do spirometry, both lung volumes as well as assessment of diffusion capacity. HRCT, of course, is very, very important to make a diagnosis of interstitial lung disease. And based on the pattern of lung involvement and the, uh, and the um, distribution of the disease, you can really come to a most likely cause of what could be the ILD. Serology is important. You have to do a serology test, especially the um, ANA, ANA panel. Uh, they are usually non-contributory to IPF, but actually directs the search for a specific interstitial lung disease like a CTD ILD. Bronchoscopy with um, uh, lung biopsy and BAL are important in certain conditions. Surgical biopsy is needed in certain conditions to get a final diagnosis. And sometimes you need to do specific workup to look for complications as well as comorbidities of interstitial lung disease. So these are uh, some clues. These are the blood lab tests that one has to usually do. Routine blood investigation is usually non-contributory, but perhaps if you find that the serum calcium or the converting enzyme uh, level is invert elevated, Perhaps you're dealing with um, sarcoidosis, like, and if the muscle enzymes are uh, erased, probably you're dealing with um, dermatomyositis, polymyositis, and the ANA and ANA panel uh, could be uh, contributory to make a diagnosis of interstitial lung disease. What is the role of biomarkers in ILD? These have been certain in, as an interest in um, between, especially in research uh, areas. Many uh, molecules are being looked at, and these include surfactant protein A and B, uh, the KL6, curbs von Langen, matrix metalloproteinases, LDH, and even pheno has been looked as biomarkers in interstitial lung disease. But as of today, they are not validated sufficiently for routine use in our day-to-day -day clinical practice. So perhaps these are things that are going to take the center stage in future. What is the role of BAL in interstitial lung disease? That BAL can give a clue for certain ILDs. For example, if the eosinophils count is more than 25% the BAL fluid, you are dealing with eosinophilic pneumonia. If the lymphocytes are more than 25%. Perhaps you're looking at sarcoid, HP, cellular NSIP, uh, oral lymphoproliferative disorder. The neutrophils are more than 50%. You are dealing with um, IPF or an acute exacerbation of IPF or an acute interstitial pneumonia. And uh, looking into the CD4, CD8 levels, all the other things, they can all give some clue in non-IPF cases. Coming to imaging, chest radiograph, as I said, is a very important investigation. Might be normal in 10% but it has a good sensitivity of about 80% and specificity of 82%. The, the other important uh, investig um, radiological investigation to be done is HRCT. This, I am sure the next speaker is going to talk about this in further more detail, but this is just to prime you to the fact that based on the pattern that you get in HRCT and based on the distribution of the disease, you can you will be able to classify the interstitial lung disease into one of these four different uh, buckets. It could either be a typical UIP, or probably UIP, or indeterminate for UIP, or inconsistent for UIP, which is otherwise called the alternate diagnosis. So based on the pattern and distribution, you can either put in one of the, that almost all interstitial lung disease can be um, put in one of these four different groups. This is the classical UIP pattern uh, that you get. The things that you get are the honeycombing, traction bronchiectasis, subpleural patchy, a distribution with an apicobasal gradient. And in some cases, perhaps in the indeterminate pattern, you may need to do a lung biopsy uh, to get a diagnosis. And um, put, combining both the histopathology and HRCT, in most cases, you might be able to know whether the patient really has IPF 
of uh, whether it is possible that the patient could be having IPF or you can also make sure that the patient does not have IPF at all and it could be uh, the interstitial lung disease is because of some other etiology. NSIP is the second uh, major interstitial lung disease. In contrast to UIP, you get a temporal homogeneity here, predominantly characterized by ground glassing and uh, um, there is a classical subpleural sparing which is associated with NSIP. Organizing pneumonia, all of us are very, very familiar with this pattern in CT now. In today's time, if you get a CT like this, the diagnosis, there is no doubt it is COVID. But in non-COVID times, if you get a pattern like this, a pattern of um, multifocal patchy consolidation or ground glassing, especially in a peribronchial distribution and fleeting shadows, you think of organizing pneumonia. Sarcoidosis is another thing which can be easily picked up if you um, read the uh, CT very critically. You get the perilymphatic distribution of um, nodules, and then you have the fissural nodules, and associated with hilar adenopathy, um, it makes um, uh, the diagnosis of sarcoid almost certain. Hypersensitivity in immunitis is another thing. As we said, this is the most important, the most common interstitial lung disease in our country as of today. As far as hypersensitivity in immunitis is concerned, previously we used to classify it as acute, subacute, and chronic, but the latest ATS guidelines has totally uh, revolutionized the concept of hypersensitivity in immunitis by classifying it into two different types as fibrosing HP and non-fibrosing HP. And this is what you get in a typical non-fibrosing HP. You get the ground soft, ground glass, central lobular opacities, very, very consistent with the non-fibrosing HP. Then you have the cystic lung diseases, LCH, which is typically seen in elderly male smokers, and LAM, which is classically seen in middle-aged middle women. Cardiac evaluation may also be needed. ECG, of course, is a must in all patients. Then most patients might need to have an echo also done to assess the presence of coronary hypertension and concurrent cardiac disease. In a way, echo could also give a clue to the possible diagnosis. For instance, you may have a patient who presents with um, breathlessness, goes to the cardiologist, finds that the patient has pulmonary hypertension, and on evaluation, you find that the patient really has systemic sclerosis, which is the cause for pulmonary hypertension in the patient. And ECHO also helps us to know the severity of the pH, pulmonary hypertension. So the uh, diagnosis of IPF, or for that matter, the diagnosis of interstitial lung disease, basically finally um, uh, revolves around this thing. You have the clinical history, physical findings, the lab data and the spirometry and other things. You also have radiology. And then in certain cases, um, you need to do a lung biopsy also. Putting it everything together, you have, we do what is called a multidimensional, multidisciplinary discussion involving the pulmonologist, the radiologist, the pathologist, and in certain cases, the rheumatologist also. And which is now this multidisciplinary discussion is now considered to be the gold standard or the standard of care for diagnosis of interstitial lung disease. And this part becomes all the more important in cases who have, which have a discordant radiological and histopathological findings. So what really are the challenges in the diagnosis of interstitial lung disease and IPF? Number one is the delay in diagnosis. Most of these patients are treated for some other condition in the periphery. And um, by the time they come to a specialist, they might have usually a far advanced disease. Ruling out other alternative diagnosis is very important, especially hypersensitivity pneumonitis, CTD, ILD, asbestosis, sarcoid. It has all been made possible by our um, awareness about these diseases and the availability of very good um, uh, quality HRCTs um, in our country at this point of time. Special conditions also require mention. The first presentation of a patient with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis to you may be as an acute exacerbation of IPF. And that becomes all the more important for you to uh, tease out and make um, a diagnosis of IPF. And then you have certain unclassifiable ILDs, which really are a headache and which are a real clinical um, uh, challenge to make a diagnosis. Obtaining surgical lung biopsy may not be easy in all cases. And in some cases, especially in the patients who have that indeterminate pattern or the inconsistent pattern, HR, uh, surgical lung biopsy is very, very important. Moving on, um, a few slides about the new kid in the block, which is called progressive fibrosing interstitial lung disease, which has um, gained our attention of late. And it has become important because it is a disease which may be amenable to treatment. Now, there are certain um, interstitial lung disease other than IPF, which can show a progressive fibrosing pattern. And these include the non-idiopathic, non-specific non, um, interstitial pneumonia, the idiopathic NSIP, 
interstitial pneumonia with autoimmune features like um, the rheumatoid ILD, the systemic sclerosis ILD, a large group of unclassifiable idiopathic interstitial pneumonias, hypersensitivity pneumonitis, sarcoid, and some occupational exposure ILDs are notorious to develop progressive uh, fibrosing phenotype. And by progressive, we mean that there is the disease is progressive, there is decline, progressive decline in lung function, there is worsening of symptoms and worsening quality of life. And the fibrosis that it causes is irreversible, it is diffuse and causes architectural destruction and distortion. Now, when you look into the all um, interstitial lung disease, other than IPF also, you can see that a certain percentage of most other interstitial lung disease are prone to develop this progressive fibrosing phenotype. It is not limited to IPF. It can happen in sarcoid. It can happen in HP. It can happen in NSIP. It can happen in autoimmune ILD. But some of them have a progressive uh, fibrosing phenotype. And when you look into the all non-IPF interstitial lung disease, you find that about 18 to 32 percent of patients develop a progressive phenotype, uh, pheno fibrosing phenotype. And the most common disease which has this tendency are the unclassifiable idiopathic interstitial pneumonias, followed closely by systemic sclerosis ILD, HP ILD, and HP and RA ILD. So these are perhaps the most common ones which can have a progressive fibrosing phenotype. And based on the uh, study, uh, based on the data from the inbuilt as well as the impulses trials, we can see that there's a steady decline in lung function in these patients, irrespective of the study in which they were enrolled and the way in respect of the pattern that they have. And this is looking into the decline in lung function by a specific etiological cause. We find that in all, uh, all these, if the patient develops a progressive fibrosing phenotype, there is for certain a decline in lung function in these patients. And how, do, how can we make a clinical diagnosis that this patient has a progressive fibrosing phenotype? There are a lot of things that you can look for. You can look into the decline in lung function based on FPC or DLCO. You can look into exercise capacity by the six-minute walk distance. You can record the symptoms. You can look for worsening. You can look at the progressive uh, serial CTs can be used. And you can also perhaps look into serum biomarkers, although they are not yet validated. But from a practical point of view, what we can use in the clinics are to use the inclusion criteria, the inbuilt study. And with that, uh, which, uh, with that, we can perhaps look into whether the patient is developing a progressive fibrosing phenotype. The criteria that we look for are a decline in FEC more than 10% or a patient who has a decline in FEC between 5 to 10% with an increased extent of fibrosis in the CT, a decline in FEC of 5 to 10% with worsening respiratory symptoms or worsening symptoms and an increase in extent of fibrosis in HRCT. So these are things which will help us know by serially following up the patient, whether the patient is developing a progressive fibrosing phenotype. So this is the flowchart as how to uh, diagnose a progressive fi fi uh, fibrosing phenotype. You basically look into the uh, clinical, you do a comprehensive clinical evaluation, PFT, HRCT, serology, and balance biopsy if required. And then you do a multidisciplinary discussion. You have a, either you get a definite diagnosis or a working diagnosis, or perhaps you might be dealing with an unclassifiable ILD. Then you decide whether you need to treat or just wait and watch. And if you are waiting and watching, you have to make sure that you follow up serially with spirometry. Uh, see symptom assessment as well as HRCT to know whether there's a decline in lung function or worsening symptoms or increasing fibrosis. At that point, you'll have to treat. And thereby, you can make a diagnosis of um, uh, progressive fibrosis, uh, interstitial lung disease. So there are lots of known and unknowns in progressive fibrosing ILD. And this happens to be my last slide as well. So what are the things that we know? We know that they have common pathogenic mechanisms. They have self-sustaining fibrosis. They are all associated with decline in lung function. There is worsening of dyspnea, a worsening a deterioration of the quality of life, and they are all notorious to produce early deaths. A lot of things are unknown as well. We still do not have a marker or predictor of disease progression. We still do not know which are the patients who are going to respond to treatment. What is the role of immunosuppression in such patients? Do antifibrotics work in such group of patients? and how to assess the treatment response and we still do not have any validated patient reported outcomes i am sure with the research that is going on in this field uh, with uh, with time most of these unknowns will become really knowns and thereby we will be able to improve the quality of life and provide better treatment to these patients who suffer from this particular phenotype of interstitial disease let me stop here and let me thank you all for the patient listening thank you sir
uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Arjun. I think, um, I don't know which is more remarkable, the fact that you were able to cover so much, uh, so very well, or you could do that in such little time. So what was would normally be a one and a half hour symposium, you've done fantastically well in 30 minutes. Uh, thank you very much for that wonderful overview of a very complicated and a difficult topic. Uh, I'm sure the audience has benefited tremendously. Uh, so uh, coming uh, to the next part, as all of you could see that from my presentation and from what uh, Dr. Arjun has said, there is an ext there is a whole lot of conditions uh, which present with fibrosis. There's unfortunately approximately 30% of them uh, which may be progressive. But how do we know what's happening? Our biggest tool, along with lung function testing, but for the for the follow-up, but for the diagnosis, the most important tool that I think we have is CT scan. CT scan and radiology has made such a difference. We no longer have to do those biopsies anymore because the radiologists have gained tremendous insights, tremendous skills, and they will guide us and our radiology will guide us in especially the diagnosis and also in follow-up. So I think every one of us need to have a special um, knowledge of the, uh, of the CT scan and the uh, imaging. To help us get a handle on this, I'm privileged to invite uh, to us Dr. Samarjit Singh Guman. Can I have Dr. Guman, please? So Dr. Samarjit Singh Guman uh, comes to us from the Sir Gangaram uh, Hospital in Delhi. He's uh, got special interest in hepatobiliary, liver transplant, and chest imaging. He's very respected uh, at this young age. He's section editor of the Journal of GI and Abdominal Radiology. He's the reviewer for Indian Journal of Radiology and Imaging uh, and the Journal of Clinical Imaging. He's a joint secretary of the Indian Society of Gastrointestinal Abdominal Imaging. He's uh, presented at national and international fora. And he's going to enlighten us today about the CT uh, about the radiology of uh, interstitial lung disease. So I may, may I invite Dr. Uh, Samarjit uh, to please take the next talk and help us understand much better this very interesting concept of interstitial lung disease. So over to Dr. Guman. Thank, Thank you very much, sir, for that uh, kind introduction. Uh, it's a privilege to be here with you on this forum, and I thank you very much for having me here. Uh, I hope you can see my screens, uh, my uh, slides right now. Yes, we can. Yes, They're very so, clear. Yeah. I'm just going to start with that now. Uh, so, HRCT in IPF and PFILD, what is HRCT? So, uh, there is a lot of confusion, even up to my clinical co colleagues. So all scans we do now with our 64 slice CTs or 128 slice or 256 CTs are high resolution scans. In the older times, our machines could not take the heat load of doing submillimeter scans. So we used to choose any 10 sections through the lung and go ahead and give you these really sharp images. Right now, all our scans are submillimeter scans. So ideally, all our CTs are high resolution or HRCTs. What is the protocol for a patient who has come for the first time to me for an HRCT? So what I will do is I will tell the patient to do a full inspiration and I will take a whole uh, volume from the top of the lung to the bottom of the lung. So volume mean, uh, being that I scan the whole lung in one breath hold and I get data which I can manipulate in any way I want or reconstruct in any way I want. The other thing I would want him to do is do a full expiration because as Dr. Arjun and Dr. Sanjeev Mehta have told us that um, hypersensitivity pneumonitis, the hallmark of which is air trapping, is better seen on the expiratory images. And then I may want to do a prone scan just at the bottom of the lung if I get some um, shadows like this or infiltrates like this to see whether they disappear or not. Because the patient lies down, you can get at the bottom of the lung some densities or opacities. If you have a patient who you think may have developed a pulmonary uh, 
um, thromboembolism, you may want to do an angiography. So why is inspiration important and how can we see whether we are in inspiration or not? If you see a round trachea like this, a well-expanded lung, you are in inspiration. If you see the trachea is collapsing like this and you see that uh, the um, pulmonary vasculature and the bronchi are getting collected, you are seeing an expiratory scan. And as you can see in the same patient, inspiration and expiration causes a lot of difference in visualizing the lung parenchyma. So what is a fibrosing ILD? That has already been covered by Dr. Arjun. And interstitial lung disease has been covered by him as well. But basically, the pathology is inflammation and or fibrosis of the lungs. And like Dr. Arjun told you, a subset of these patients will go ahead and deteriorate really fast and they will progress. Their fibrosis will progress. So it will be a progressive fibrosing interstitial lung disease. IPF is the poster boy or the prototype of a progressive fibrosing ILD. There are other, in, uh, other progressive fibrosing ILDs like IIPs, CTD-related ILDs, fibrotic chronic hypersensitivity, pneumonitis, sarcoidosis, etc. Right? I'll, during most of our training, we learn to differentiate idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis or IPF from the other fibrosing lung diseases. Right? Because the treatment of two was supposed to be very different. And they were given different sets of drugs. Now, how do we decide that this is a fibrosing ILD and not just an alveolitis? So we look at four main things. We look at honeycombing. We look at traction bronchiectasis. Traction means pulling. We look at volume loss. The lung sits down a little bit. And we see reticulation, which are these lines at the periphery of the lung. Right? So these are the four things we look at before we decide that we are doing looking at a fibrosing ILD. So when we do a fibrosing ILD, uh, when the clinician sends them to us, either he sends it for a diagnosis. After diagnosis, he would like us to subclassify it into IPF, which is idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis or non-idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Do you think it's an IPF? Do you think it's an HSP? Do you think it's an NSIP? So he expects a certain bit of subclassification. You can actually prognosticate these patients. So if you have a lot of honeycombing at initial presentation, for example, you have a bad prognosis. You can actually do HRCT scorings. There are lots of scoring systems out there. If you are into research, you have to rule out acute exacerbations. You can follow up these patients for radiological worsening. And now you can use CT as an inclusion or an endpoint for clinical trials as it was used in the inbuilt trial as an inclusion criteria. Okay. So what is IPF? So we have done ILD. So we'll just look at a subset. What is IPF? It is a chronic progressive fibrosing interstitial pneumonia. It occurs in adults and it involves only the lungs. And the uh, most uh, interesting or the most uh, vital point is it should have no identifiable cause. Okay, so it is idiopathic. And what is UIP? So I was talking about IPF. Now I'm talking about UIP. So how is this sudden uh, jump from one three-letter word to another three-letter word? So UIP is what the pathologist and the radiologist see. IPF is what the pulmonologist diagnoses after he's gone through the clinical history and the clinical features and the blood tests of the patient. So UIP is the CT or pathological correlate of IPF. It is not a specific diagnosis. Radiologists and pathologists identify findings that include that indicate UIP. They do not make the diagnosis of IPF. They identify the pattern of UIP. So for me, if I'm diagnosing UIP, it is, and the clinician finds that there is a matching clinical ground, then we diagnose IPF. UIP can be seen in other fibrosing ILDs, which I will just show you. So the diagnosis of IPF, the uh, before 2011, there was another paper with major and minor criteria. Then in 2011, there were three main uh, divisions when you looked at a CT. It was either a UIP pattern or it was a possible UIP pattern or it was inconsistent with an UIP pattern. Then in 2018, the ATS came out with another uh, document, which I will talk about just now. And there was another white paper by the Fleischner Society. So these two were almost similar to each other. And they were the basis for diagnosing IPF or idiopathic or UIP on CT, which, like I told you, will be the basis for diagnosing IPF later on. 
So what changed from UIP? It stayed at UIP. From probable, possible, it became probable. So one of the things was if I say if I borrow a hundred rupees from you and I say it is possible I'll return it. You may not give me that hundred rupees, and I tell you I'll probably return it. You may find yes, this guy is trustworthy because probable has a more positive connotation. Also, if you have four categories in which to subcategorize patients, you are more confident because anything which was not UIP or inconsistent or not totally inconsistent used to get lumped into possible UIP. Whereas here you have these two patterns in which you can go up from here or come down from here, so the diagnostic accuracy was supposed to increase, right? So these are the three pillars. on which the diagnosis of ipf is based as dr arjun told you there are clinical findings there are ct findings and there is pathology on ct you can have four uh, major patterns you can have the uip pattern which i say it is uip i am confident go ahead then i can say it's probably uip you may get your 100 rupees back and it may be indeterminate for a uip pattern which means i don't know what it is i am not sure what it is it could turn out to be uip later on it could turn out to be something else and there there is alternate diagnosis where i am sure that no this is not uip this is not going to turn out to be ipf this is something else right so how do i diagnose uip what are the criteria for calling a ct uip confidently there should be a basal sub pleural that means towards the bottom of the lung and towards the margin of the lung should be the major involvement it should be heterogeneous the lung should look different at different parts there should be something called honey combing definitely present and then you can have reticular opacities which we saw and traction bronchiectasis bronchiectasis and bronchiectasis which i will just show you in probable uip you have all of these but you do not have honey combing honey combing is absent in indeterminate if you ask the ats people they want it to be basal and sub pleural if you ask the fleischner people they say it can be anywhere but you just have subtle reticulation and you do not know what is going to happen to this later on in alternative diagnosis you have everything which doesn't fit into this it, this was basal that is upper this was sub pleural that is peribronchovascular this was again sub pleural that is perilymphatic you don't want you want to see cysts you want to see consolidation nodules extensive ground glassing mosaic attenuation all of these will tell you this is not an ipf or this is not a uip pattern so why is ct important in ipf why are we going through uh, the through the bother of trying to classify it as i'm sure or i'm not sure because as dr arjun told you you may require histological proof and to undergo lung biopsy for sick patients for old patients is not uh, without complications so if i say to dr uh, sanjeev or dr arjun that i am seeing an hrct pattern of uip then he looks at the clinical and he says yeah i cannot see anything else he need not do anything else he not need not do a bal he need not do a lung biopsy and he need not do a tblb he need not do anything he can diagnose he can diagnose ipf confidently and start treating the patient the fleischner society goes one step forward it says not only can you do it when you diagnose ipf when you say it is probable uip even then you can diagnose ipf so this uh, so the ats says that only when you are sure it is uip uh, uip you go ahead and uh, treat for ipf and the fleischner people say that even when you say it is probable it is as good as saying up to 90% of these patients will turn out to have an ipf just to show you what a typical ipf looks like uip sorry uip looks like i keep getting confused in those because you have to remember this is what the radiologist says he will call it a uip pattern which may be there in ipf for other diseases and uh, the clinical uh, side will diagnose the ipf so basal means towards the bottom of the lung you can see the involvement is more towards the bottom or the although there is some anterior involvement sub pleural again towards the periphery of the lung you see honey combing which is these multiple cysts which look like uh, the hexagonal holes which you see in a honeycomb and you see traction bronchiectasis and bronchiolectasis which is the pulling and opening up of these bronchi as they go you see lack of tapering normally they should taper towards the end and this is because the fibrosis is pulling the bronchi open and you see how heterogeneous the lung is it's different here it's different here and it's different here right 
so this is what a honeycomb looks like just to show you honeycombing they can be you need not have multiple layers but generally they are multiple you have to differentiate it from emphysema you have to differentiate it from peripheral traction bronchiectasis and you have to di differentiate it from dependent uh, changes of atelectasis along with subpleural cysts and emphysema this is what i meant by having to differentiate so this is a patient uh, this is a minimum intensity projection these black black holes are basically emphysematous areas in the lung and you can see this patient has emphysema more towards the upper lobes and towards the upper lobes you see the subpleural emphysematous cysts but towards the bottom you see uh, you see uh, honeycombing so if changes are very subtle and you have just these uh, small cysts towards the bottom and some reticulation you are not sure whether you are looking at honeycombing or whether you are looking at emphysematous cysts with uh, some subtle thickening uh, this is a video again just to show you uh, the typical uip pattern where you have the basal subpleural involvement and the other thing i wanted to show you over here was this very large i'm sorry this very large uh, hiatus hernia which this patient has and gastroesophageal reflux disease has been that's a very large hiatus hernia this patient has and gerd has been often associated uh, with uh, lung fibrosis and the uip pattern and you can see these cysts and more of them as we go towards the bottom a probable uip pattern is the same thing as a uip pattern but you do not see the honeycombing right this is a probable uip pattern you see some traction bronchiectasis is happening here you see some reticulation and uh, now you are confused about whether these are honeycombs or uh, whether these are honeycombs or there are traction bronchiectasis but if you look closely you should be able to see the linearity of these um, cystic areas at the lung bases again just to show you honeycombing towards the lung bases over here and over here there is only a single layer and you can see irregular bronchi branching and these are traction this is traction bronchiectasis why are we going through all this because this is the difference between uip and probable uip although the latest studies show that it basically doesn't matter you can treat both of them the same way again just to show you traction bronchiectasis happening towards the periphery of the lung now what about ground glassing if the ground glassing occurs in the areas of fibrosis it is probably related to the fibrosis itself you should not see ground glassing away from the large areas of ground glassing away from the areas of fibrosis if you see that you are either dealing with an acute exacerbation or you are dealing with a different pathology again just to show you the non tapering or traction bronchiectasis so we looked at traction bronchiectasis we looked at honeycombing reticulation and now we know how to diagnose the fibrosing lung disease what is indeterminate so indeterminate is these kind of subtle reticulations which do not go away even when you put the patient prone and like i told you i do not know what is going to happen to these patients when they are on follow up what is going to happen so there are a lot of pitfalls in calling uh, in calling uip or not calling uip so mosaic attenuation is one of the things which i look at and i say oh this might not be uip this may be a chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis but lot of patients who have mosaic attenuation later have a final diagnosis of ipf all right so that is one of the places where we get stuck again honeycombing is one of the places where we get stuck and all patients who have an ipf may not have a ct pattern of uip so these are things we have to keep in mind now what about other fibrosing ilds we looked at uh, ipf right now we have diagnosed ipf uip so once you have the uip pattern you say right this is probably going to be dr mehta will do his test and will probably say no this is going to be an ipf and he will treat accordingly but other fibrosing ilds which we looked at so let's look at this patient so this is a 56 year old female with joint pain it looks exactly like the uip pattern i showed you basal uh, subpleural honeycombing but look at the clinical profile and look at the exuberant honeycombing so the honeycombing is involving more than 40% of the lung it is actually the dominant finding throughout this whole lung it is a 56 year old female with joint pains not a 60 year old man with breathlessness <clears throat> and no inciting factors this patient actually had rheumatoid arthritis related interstitial lung disease but if you look at the if you look at uh, the imaging it is a uip pattern but if you go and correlate it with the clinical it is a ctd related ild and not 
an IPF. Another fibrosing lung disease where you see traction bronchiectasis. I'm sorry, happening here. You see the bronchi getting pulled. It is asymmetrical on both sides. And you can see this is pretty homogeneous. The lung looks the same everywhere over here. And you see an area of subpleural sparing. This is a fibrotic NSIP. Again, you see the opening up of the bronchi over here. This is traction bronchiectasis. So you know you're dealing with a fibrosing ILD. But are you dealing with a UIP pattern? No, you are not because there is subpleural sparing and the dominant involvement is not heterogeneous. It is pretty homogeneous. And this was a fibrotic NSIP. Again, you look at what you feel may be a UIP pattern, but there are certain things that set apart what looks like a UIP pattern from uh, UIP pattern in IPF from UIP pattern in connective tissue disease related ILD. One is this exuberant honeycombing, which we have already looked at. So if you have honeycombing, which involves more than 40% of the lung, you need to think I may be looking at a CTD related ILD. Another thing is this sharp margin which you see, which is known as the straight line sign or the straight corner sign, where if you get this straight line sign right at the bottom and just cis at the bottom, you need to evaluate the patient for an connective tissue uh, CTD related or connective tissue disorder related ILD, particularly if it is a woman. The other thing is the four corner sign where you have fibrosis involving the upper anterior and the posterior inferior margin of the lungs. And these three signs are pointers towards the fact that this may this will not be an idiopathic disease it may be a connective tissue related uh, connective tissue disorder related interstitial lung disease right so this patient has traction bronchiectasis he has fibrosis his architectural distortion he has honeycombing right so you say why not uip because the pattern of fibrosis is pre predominantly along the bronchi it's peribronchial the uh, fibrosis and the traction bronchiectasis is more anterior and very little involvement towards the posterior subpleural region. So even though this patient has bronchiectasis and what looks like honeycombing anteriorly, we do not call it a UIP pattern because it does not fit into our four criteria. Another patient, okay, so we have fibrotic areas here. We have some pulling. You can see that this is getting pulled the fissure is getting pulled up because there is fibrosis. There is some opening up of the bronchi. And what you also see is that the fibrosis is predominantly peribronchial over here as well. And you also see areas of bright lung and areas of dark lung in a lobular pattern. This lobular pattern is fairly suggestive of a fibrotic hypersensitivity pneumonitis, which, as Dr. Mehta told us, is the most common uh, fibrosing ILD in India. And in our practice, is also the most common fibrosing ILD. Esophageal dilatation is a, is, a, is a pointer towards scleroderma related ILD or even uh, empty uh, mixed connective tissue related, uh, disease related ILD. And uh, when we look at this, we generally know we are looking at a CTD related ILD. And the other findings in the lung, you see some traction bronchiectasis, you see some um, ground glassing, and these are all findings which are suggestive of ILD. And remember, this are traction bronchiectasis. This is not honeycombing. We should not see uh, significant ground glassing away from the areas of fibrosis if we want to call it UIP pattern. So this is not UIP pattern. This is a connective tissue and disease related ILD. Moving on uh, to CTs in uh, progressive fibrosing ILDs. Like Dr. Arjun told us, these patients will go on to have a bad clinical outcome. They will go on and deteriorate clinically. So what will CT do? Uh, what can CT do in these cases? Does it have a role? So uh, this is a paper which has suggested definitions of progressive fibrosis in clinical practice. Right? There are clinical of, and there are three basic uh, basic pillars again on which the diagnosis of a progressive fibrosing ILD is based. One is symptoms or clinical findings. The second is lung function tests and the third is CT. So CT has a role here as you can see and as Dr. Arjun told us that if you have FVC of uh, relative decline of FVC or 5% or more and you correlate it with CT then despite treatment then you can call it you can classify this patient as a progressive fibrosis. And similarly, progressive symptoms with increased fibrosis on HRCT again classifies this patients, uh, these patients into progressive fibrosing interstitial lung disease. 
this was the inbuilt trial this was the this was the criteria in the inbuilt trial for accepting a patient into the study and again you can see hrct was used as one of the one of the defining criteria for inclusion or one of the inclusion criteria for this trial so ct definitely other than the other than the fact that i have uh, other than the um, uh, topics you discussed earlier in ct does have a role in pf ild as well ct can how do you look at progression in pf ild there are lots of ways to do that the easiest way is just to uh, put the ct at uh, progressive cts at the same position at predefined positions and try and look at what is happening to the lung over there so look at this portion of the lung posteriorly this was fine this now has developed fibrosis traction bronchiectasis and honeycombing so definite progression and then 12 months later there is again progression of disease you can see this portion which was fine has now progressed similarly towards the lo lower lungs you can see that there is progression of the disease even along the fissures over here and towards the posterior aspects of the lung so ct can tell you progression uh, pretty simple to do it just scan the patient and put it up at the same level so now what are future directions so um, maybe dr mehta or dr arjun don't want uh, to spend time looking at all of these scans and sitting with radiologists and comparing this comparing them already we have automatic quanti automated quantification of lung fibrosis we have machine learning coming in where you just feed your scan first you teach the machine how to look at fibrosis and you then feed your scan into the machine and then it will spit out the amount of fibrosis that this patient has and whether it has increased or decreased there are still some problems with machine learning it is not able to differentiate atelectasis from fibrosis sometimes but i'm sure in the coming uh, coming years or coming months uh, it will become much better at catching this and uh, giving you a more accurate reading so in conclusion hrct has assumed an important position in the diagnosis of ipf and typical ct findings in the correct clinical context will obviate the need for biopsy and you can just go ahead and treat the patient we can easily diagnose fibrotic features in other fibrotic ilds we may help to prog prognosticate non ipf ilds presenting with severe fibrosis honeycombing we may be able to give you a fibrosis score Uh, as the patient comes in at the first time and then we can do a fibrosis score later to tell you whether things are better or worse right and in future ct may provide more automated accurate quantification of lung fibrosis thank you very much for your attention and that's all i have for you right now thank you yeah <laughs> thank you dr goman uh that is wonderful Uh, I sat here like a student learning, and it was uh, very informative uh, and a comprehensive assessment, a very delicate assessment of how you can tease out the various ILDs and uh, the progressive. So I'm sure my uh, our audience learned a lot. I will now come back to you during the Q and A, but for the present time, I'm going to request uh, the next speaker to take on. so you now my audience knows uh, what are the various interstitial lung diseases how do you assess them clinically how do you assess them radiologically and after you've all done that then how are you going to treat them so for that i am uh, privileged to invite my very dear friend that i have been asked to introduce somebody with no introductory information but i don't need it because a he's a very dear friend and we everybody knows dr nitin abhankar he is from pune uh, a wonderful uh, doctor tremendous interest in airways diseases and interstitial lung diseases but what very many people know but some may not uh, he's got great interest in intervention so thoracoscopy thoracoscopic uh, lung biopsies so he's really at the at the cutting edge in india in all of these what many of you may not know uh, that he has tremendous other interests such as poetry and music uh, and i've been privileged to get his book to read over and above i don't know where you get the time nitin and he is a tremendous uh, exercise uh, freak so he's always exercising how he does all of this i want to need to learn from him but today i'm going to learn from him how to treat interstitial lung disease over to you nitin and thank you very much for accepting our invitation and joining us
डॉक्टर अभ्यंक thank you sanjeev i i i am i'm i'm sure i mean whatever you said i hope to you know, fulfill at least 25% of all that so i think very flattering words but i don't think i'm uh, all that uh, multi talented or multi faceted i hope my slides are visible yes sir uh, i i yeah yes, i have to tweak this yeah tweak this a little bit and said newer insights because i think this is maybe my insights and somebody of me or may not agree with it so and i have also tried to add a little bit of pf ild that is uh, along with ipf so i think these two things which you'll uh, look into it i might is not really going to be comprehensive in the truest sense but if you start with the basic management of ipf alone even that is quite massive and it you know most of the treatment of course if i have a disease the sarcoidosis so the management is different if i have a ctd ild the management is different but if i have a progressive fibrosing interstitial lung disease then the the two things which come uh, to our mind first are going to be two anti fibrotic drugs uh we had and apart from that i mean let me finish the other things first of course you have to manage comorbidities for example somebody having a grd you have to do that and there are a lot of data on that even a surgical correction there is uh, research were going on on that uh, pulmonary rehabilitation like in copd is is applicable to some patients in um, ipf and it has some value of course you have to palliate most of them of course you have to vaccinate most of them of course you have to manage their symptoms very well so you have to and and try to manage the symptoms very well in fact cough sometimes in ipf is a nightmare it probably responds to almost nothing and you are struggling with what that cough is going to go away with because it's a dry hacking kind of a cough and you really are not getting on top of it of course breathlessness becomes more and more non manageable as the lung fibrosis worsens and therefore symptom management becomes one hell of a task all uh, you know it's it's not as simple as treating an asthmatic uh, and getting him better quickly well in those situations supplemental oxygen does come into the play very very rare uh, incident instances where nai we can help if there is a coexistent emphysema but mostly you are going to be dealing with supplemental oxygen and somebody who gets dependent on it you will be thinking of a lung transplant of course all through this you will have to keep them nutritionally up you have to keep them nutritionally evaluated cachectic patients will do worse well nourished patients will do better even when you are thinking of lung transplant you have to do this to this do the rehabilitation program get them somewhere where they are manageable post operatively and then only a lung transplant can happen and therefore a ongoing patient education and support is equally important but this is going to be impossible to manage in the next 20 25 minutes so i'm going to focus on one single part of it which is anti fibrotics and even amongst the anti fibrotics i'm assuming that the august audience here knows enough about perfenadone because perfenadone came to us in 2009 and we have been living with it for last 11 years painfully or joyfully is everybody's take on it but i think we have definitely as indians we have definitely not been all that comfortable with the upper gi problems that the perfenadone does create particularly the recommended doses are concerned so if i am tar- targeting at 1800 i would definitely reach there in most of the patients but when i am try- targeting at 2400 mg per day of perfenadone i struggle there and uh, i in the sense my patients struggle there and that's that's where the real uh, difficulty lies so i think we have to keep that in mind and then move ahead with the new kid in the block from the cost point of view because it came to india somewhere around 2014 is immediately just before or just after its its approval in us fda so nentadanib got approved along with perfendon in us fda in 2014 so 14 to 20 is 6 years and in this 6 years we have had access to nentadanib but the access was largely limited to a very very select very affording patients or some people who are compensated by the various uh, sanctioning agencies only those kind of patients could take nentadanib so 
our experience with uh, interdenip has been sparse and limited and i'm going to show you one trial which has shown uh, shifting from porfenidon to interdenip and i was impressed by the numbers that they have shown so in my uh, practice till the price became realistic there were like something like three patients over the last six years and then all of a sudden last one one and a half month it's off patent it's been marketed by multiple companies this is let me confess this is my fourth seminar that i'm attending the first one to learn and then the three i'm disseminating in different platforms and different contexts so let me confess that my talk will focus on nentadanib and it's per, per comparative analysis with perfendon because these are the two antifibrotics that we are going to deal with for some time of course before i go into the perfendon nentadanib uh, i wouldn't say an argument because they each of them have their own advantages and disadvantages and we'll sort that out but there are a lot of therapies which have been found to be potentially harmful for example embrisentan for example the triple therapy that was given with ipf which was prednisolone azathioprine and acetylcysteine for example warfarin for example everolimus all these were found to be potentially harmful so they were you are discouraged from using them there are potentially ineffective therapies for example bosentan imatinib mesentan sildenafil some of us will practically will agree with it some of us will not nsetelsystin all of these were potentially ineffective therapies so i think what has been cleared by the fda particularly the us fda and uh, all over um, many fdas the european fda as well are perfenidone and entadenib we are really looking at entadenib now all of a sudden because we were convinced that it's a good drug we were convinced that it is as good as perfenidone if not better but the cost was completely a factor and therefore it was kept on a back burner kind of a thing for a very very long time and now all of a sudden our interest in it has got reignited because it has become cost sens sensible and what what i mean by that is the typical monthly therapy which would be maybe say 6000 6500 for perfenidone uh the if the correct doses are used would be even a little cheaper th with mentadanib it will be around 5400 something in that range so i think we and of course that will keep probably coming down with more companies and more indian farmers in marketing this product so i think that's going to be an interesting territory so we start with nentadanib and i'll keep going back to perfenidone because as uh, as a comparator as well as something which is has still some or i would say substantial number of value there so inhibition uh, it inhibits the activation of the signaling pathways involved in the pathogenesis of ipf it inhibits proliferation of migration of fibroblasts myofibroblasts with a reduction in the synthesis and deposition of extracellular matrix in the lung and these are the sites where it acts so that's 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 what uh, we were looking at its primary indication or rather the approved indications are definitely two and then we have some extended indications as we would say, we, we would touch upon with the pfild concept so for treatment of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis it's a definite yes there the slow to slow the rate of decline in pf of lung functions in patients with systemic sclerosis associated sscild so that's the second indication for these indications the approved dosage is 150 mg twice daily administers 12 hours support sometimes diarrhea limits the usage of 150 mg twice daily and in that case as a stop gap measure 100 mg twice daily is also marketed and that is available so what one can do is go down to that dose and when the diarrhea is controlled by other measures we can and make an attempt to come back to 150 twice daily again in patients with hepatic impairment also this dose comes down to 100 mg twice daily so somebody with a child spoke a you might start with 100 mg twice daily rather than 150 bid now where does this 150 come from so it comes from a very beautiful trial called tomorrow it was a randomized placebo controlled one year study nearly which was a dose finding trial which compared 50 old qid 50 bid 100 mg bid and 150 bid so with that over a period of time they found that the most appropriate dose uh, which the tomorrow's uh, conclusion was 150 mg bid and then then the two again very robust trials one was impulses one the other one is impulses two both similar in design 
randomized placebo control double bind nearly one year again phase 3 trials with a replicate design and uh, the randomization was around 3 to 2 ratio around 630 patients here and 425 patients in this group and then they were followed up and there are some interesting follow up trials beyond impulses beyond tumor also because some of these patients in the trials were continued on these therapies and followed up as to what happened to them so the first part is what was the proof of concept with perfenidon it was there with with uh, nintedanib it is a little more stronger or little more robust that impulses one impulse two both showed that as compared to the placebo and when when you are not giving anything or oh, the drop in the annual rate is if it is if it was say for for example 240 with here it was less than 50% so approximately 50% reduction in the drop in the fvc was seen in tomorrow in impulses 2 and impulses 1 all the trials and that that was substantial with a statistical significance and that's something which is the sort of a proof of concept that these drugs work because very importantly it's imp important for, for us to be sure that these drugs work perfenidone as well as nintedanib because the patient is not going to experience anything he doesn't sense a 130 or 250 cc loss unless until he has reached a very critical stage so early patient will not realize a very late patient in any case is not in a capacity to realize that he is getting better because he is sick as sick as he was one year ago and therefore this concept of starting these patients early on the correct therapy and continuing has to go with a lot of counseling and therefore the counseling part it will be very very relevant to talk about that uh, in both the context of both the antifibrotics perfenidone or nintedanib and you have to be whatever you are prescribing needs to be backed up by a robust counseling telling them not to expect dramatic improvement and we'll 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 touch upon whether some of these are actually shown some improvement towards the end of these slides because some interesting trials are there in that regard but largely speaking what we are expecting is we are expecting a decline in the deterioration by 50% per year and if that is something which is good enough for us to get convinced then only we are able to convince our patients about it this point in time it's not a recommendation we will say we'll compel the patient to take a particular drug for and as an antifibrotic so we are supposed to open ended we enter into the discussion with this patient and offer both or one or whatever is our choice at that point in time and then make the patient make a sensible choice about using them knowing well what the limitations and what the advantages of taking these are most of the patients will listen to us but at the same time this is not like what we are going to prescribe for say a course of augmentin or whatever you know uh, straight forward course of pulmonary tuberculosis a standard guideline they recommended use and it's more or less mandatory on the patients to take it whereas here it is not not the story and the fibrotics are not that well validated to be compelled though the efficacy is pretty good and it is impressive in addition dentedanib demonstrated significant reductions in the risk of acute ipf exacerbations in both impulses 1 and tomorrow trial so uh, sorry impulses 2 and tomorrow trial so impulses 1 was a little ambivalent about the exacerbations but in impulses to both arms separated well and even in tomorrow trials there were a clear difference which was statistically significant and therefore this is something which adds a lot of value over and above perfenidone does because perfenidone has not been demonstrated to reduce the reduction uh, risk of reduction in acute ipf exacerbations and all of us know that ipf exacerbations are associated with as high as 90% mortality in some situations and therefore there are a dreaded complication which sometimes just makes a patient of ipf suddenly worse and maybe it could be fatal in one of these exacerbations so i think nintedanib has some action we have been watching this with great deal of interest but with the kind of a cost structure which was associated with nearly a lakh and a half rupees a year or even in a concessional price around 60 65000 rupees a year very few people could afford it today we are able to put more patients i wouldn't say all patients but more patients on nintedanib 
in a substantial large number of patients with IPF and we'll come to the PFILD very soon. So nintadenib also consistently demonstrated a favorable trend in the all-cause mortality. This is not statistical significance, but a trend which is worth noting that almost in all the arms, all-cause mortality, impulses one is less in, I mean, more in the placebo groups always and less in the nintadenib groups. That's due to respiratory causes, again, similarly reduced considerably and on treatment deaths also considerably less in impulses one and impulses two. So I think uh, though the statistical significance is not uh, very robust because the number of patients keep dwindling here, but at the same time, uh, there is a favorable trend in all-cause mortality. So there could be a factor which will be proven in near future or distant future. But at this, at the point in time, we can notice the trend and possibly pass that information all to the patient as well. What were the adverse events that people came across? The commonest of them, of course, was uh, diarrhea, which was there mild to moderate in intensity. And it actually led to premature discontinuation of the study medication in less than 5% of the patient, but that was still an important side effect. And uh, uh, we have to keep that in mind that people will get diarrhea and therefore that 100 milligram twice daily dose is there as a backup plan or a plan B in that situation. So in uh, pooled analysis of these impulses and tomorrow trials, there was a consistent treatment effect. The adjusted annual rate of decline we have seen was less than half as compared to the placebo a significant reduction in the acute IPF exacerbation. So this slide summarizes what is good related to it. And there is a trend towards reduction in the risk of all cause and the respiratory mortality and a significant reduction in the risk of non-treatment mortality. The uh, statistical significance was reached in uh, risk on treatment mortality was concerned. So I think that that is something worth keeping in mind. And then this particular advantage or findings were reproduced across number of subgroup analysis, whether it is sex-based, whether it is Asian versus white, whether it is elderly versus uh, little younger, whether people were smokers, current, former or not, whether there was an emphysema present or not, and various thresholds of lung function. So all these subgroup analysis more or less were in favor of um, using nintadenib rather than not using it. We come to the second disorder for which it is already having a USFD approval. That is SCCILD, chronic connective tissue disease characterized by progressive fibrosis, endothelial dysfunction resulting in a small vessel vasculopathy, fibroblast dysfunction, and a resultant excessive collagen function and fibrosis and immunological abnormalities. We have one study from North India which shows that there is about 120 cases per million in our country. Lung involvement accounts for significant morbidity and is a leading cause of mortality in patients with systemic sclerosis. So if you are encountering a patient with systemic sclerosis, and this is the first or, or, or the, the, the landmark trial, so-called census, where patient who had systemic sclerosis and HRCD chance showing fibrosis affecting at least 10% of the lungs were included. They were put in nintadenib arm versus placebo arm. A total of 576 patients received at least one dose of nintadenib or placebo. So that's that's a reasonably robust number and was followed up over again 52 weeks and was nearly reproducing the same kind of a data that nearly half the reduction in the in the reduction in the lung function was more or less halved. The most common it was putting once again in this trial was diarrhea, which was reported in a fairly large number of patients, but again, mild to moderate in, in severity. And uh, and it was also seen in around 30% of the patient with placebo group. So we have to take that, balance it out in when we are prescribing and talking about the diarrhea as, uh, as prevalent as that. Very frankly, we have started using this particular product in the context of what is called as COVID-related pulmonary fibrosis, which you may classify as PFILD, but it's not a true PFILD. It's an improving variant of a fibrosing lung disease because the fibrosis or the inflammation is acute in nature. And then more or less sudden, within a matter of few weeks, it reaches its peak or nadir, whatever we want to call it. And then it is gradually improving with the help of steroids and 
an antifibrotic is indicated in some of these patients where you can document a significant amount of fibrosis and you are not sure whether this fibrosis is progressive or resolving in that window of opportunity many doctors all over this country are using it and surprisingly i, I was not referring to uh, the pfild in the i mean uh, i'm the fibrotic uh, component in the covid as a primary uh, in, uh, indication here it is largely reserved for pfild in very uh, various other indications and ipf of course and ssaild but this is an interesting entity which can uh, where it could be of some use the incidence of diarrhea whatever we have seen in last just one and a half months and about 100 patients have been put on this particular agent because as a referral center for lung fibrosis i receive a lot of these patients coming to us in hypoxemic states, of course, they go on steroids in sufficient doses. Of course, they are followed up very closely. Many of them are on home oxygen and many of them continue improving. And I'm expecting over the next three months or six months, many of them will stabilize. In the interim period, if I have a documented fibrosis, I'm putting these patients on lentidinipine. In, in the last one and a half month, I have not had a single person discontinuing it because of the diarrhea. Two or three people reported mild diarrhea out of 100. So that number seems to be a little different in our country when a large scale use has been taken up. So I, 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 I think uh, Indians are very resistant to the idea of diarrhea in the first place, probably, because we are infected with so many other uh, diarrhea causing agents already. Anyway, I mean, I don't know the answer of that. Please don't take me seriously on that particular remark. But at the same time, uh, it could be used or considered in that particular indication. So tomorrow, open label extension study, which is the extension of the tomorrow trial after completing 52 weeks, around 84 patients were included in the open label extension arm of it, where it entered an 150 milligram twice daily. The comparators received placebo and entered an 50 milligram once daily. I don't know why, where that dose comes from. But at the same time, what was seen was that outcome was that in the open level extension uh, extension trial people with nintadanip 150 bid died less probability of having acute exacerbation reduced and more than one acute exacerbation was seen in less number of patients as you as used uh, as compared to the comparator where the 50 milligram dose was used and uh, and placebo or uh, i mean received plus placebo and a 50 milligram nintadanip so results from tomorrow open extension phase support and effect of nintadenib on slowing the progression of IPF beyond 52 weeks. New, no new safety signals were identified up to 86 months of treatment. So this was something which is encouraging. Impulses on was the trial, which was an open table extension of the phase three trial on nintadenib. So impulses trial got finished here and then impulses on began here, where there were 430 patients continuing and initiating in 3,304 uh, patients. And then median exposure time with intidenib in both impulses and impulses on what trial was 44.7. This is an interesting data to look at. Once again, diarrhea was the most uh, uh, commonly encountered in nemesis uh, as regards this drug goes. It's upper GI problems with perfenidone is the lower GI on the diarrhea is the most frequent side effect of the nintadenib. Similar to those observed in placebo-treated patients in impulses, uh, the other, for example, cardiovascular, myocardial infarction, bleeding, all those other side effects were not all that different in the other groups if diarrhea was the only one. The change in FVC, the mean change in FVC for baseline was substantial when, when, when we looked at nintadenib as compared to the placebo. And in the nintadenib continued group, of course, it was going to do better because they had received one year of nintadenib in advance. And those were which were initiated nintadenib later on, the uh, of course, I mean, the, it's going, it was going to be a little uh, different. But still, there was a substantial uh, adjusted annual rate of decline in FVC was a little better uh, in, in the terms of uh, people who received nintadenib even in the later group. Uh, Effect on nintadenib on slowing the progression of IPF persist beyond four years was their conclusion and continued treatment with nintadenib had a manageable safety and tolerability profile with no new safety signals which are identified. Of course, you have to remember when we are doing this kind of a trial of extension into the five years old, you have to try and remember how many of your 
IPF patients are alive at the end of between two to five years. Untreated, they would be probably dead before all this. I'm sure if they were on our triple therapy from the Royal Brompton, many of them would be actually dead because of are able to follow, follow it up for a substantial duration, that means they are staying alive. That by itself is a big thing. And the fact that their lung functions are declined or some of these changes are not so clear actually is overridden by the very fact that the advantage is definitely robust and they're still alive. That's something which is worth keeping in mind. So that brings me to the last part of this particular talk is nintadib in, in PFILD. And this was phase three. The trial was called inbuilt. It ran on 15 countries and on 153 sites, nearly 663 patients, half in the placebo, half in the... Uh, the primary endpoint, once again, was the rate of decline in the FVC at the end of one year. Secondary endpoints at 52 weeks were absolute change from the baseline, total score of K-build, acute exacerbation of the interstitial lung disease, or death or death with uh, event in the uh, in the percentage kind of a death. So the characteristic of the overall population, more or less comparable in nintendo versus say, two thirds of these patients had a UIP-like fibrotic pattern and one third of these patients had other fibrotic patterns also. That is something which is worth considering and keeping in mind that this is a trial and I think probably a little brave when it was first conceived and the most frequent diagnosis uh, was uh, of the ILD was a chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis and an autoimmune ILD. Many of our doctors, many of our Indian clinicians have been using perfenidon, sometimes even lentidinib, and sometimes even both for that matter, when it comes to a PF ILD progressive fibrosis related to some other disease. For example, the commonest one which we encounter in Western Maharashtra is hypersensitive pneumonia. We are not as high as, say, Jaipur data, but we are around close to around 30% of our patients are with chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis and the CTD ILDs. So these patients, will they benefit when they are showing a progressive fibrotic uh, progression? I mean, ongoing fibrotic progression. If, you, if that gets documented, will they be right candidates? Yes, that is what the inbuilt trial is trying to tell us. That if you look at their data, the Overall population, patients with a UIP-like fibrotic pattern and also with the patients with other fibrotic patterns, for example, an NSIP fibrotic or some other patterns, chronic HP, which is not really fitting into any particular pattern in all these, even in the CTDI, this, what, what was seen was there was a substantial rate in the decline was just around 80 ml as compared to around 187 ml. So that is again, little more than 50%. So that is that data is encouraging and the two arms are clearly separating within the four to six weeks. And that is something which will come to towards the end of it when we compare per front on with Nintadanip. So uh, I, I, once again, similar favorable changes were seen in all the other secondary endpoints. I won't go into the depth of it because of the brevity of time. And of course, more or less same adverse effect profile that we had, were looking at. Nearly 66% of them getting diarrhea here, where as compared to in the placebo, just around 23%, 24%. So that is something which is worth. With this particular trial in, in their uh, kitty, uh, USFD approved for the first time for the group of progressive interstitial lung diseases, March to 2020, it approved nintedanib for the treatment of chronic fibrosing interstitial lung disease with a progressive phenotype, irrespective of the etiology. And that's pro probably opens up a little bit of license for us in, uh, though we can't classically call it a progressive uh, um, um, fibrotic disease, but a COVID-related lung fibrosis also can uh, can stitch your imagination and put that on, though it is an improving kind of a fibrosis rather than a worsening fibrosis. And you'll have to document the fibrosis carefully well before get jumping onto the idea of using dentatinib there. Steroids will remain as a mainstay. Oxygen will remain as a mainstay, but other drugs can be considered. Now, uh, uh, can we switch? Somebody is on perfinodon, and a lot of our, our patients are on perfinodon. Can we switch? So this is a German compassionate program and nearly 77% of the patients actually were 
because th th this is a bad challenge for the nitrogenic because the disease was progression on perfenolone which is shown to be equally effective in re reducing the progression otherwise and then they were switched from this to that and what was seen is that nitrogenic treatment was generally well tolerated and associated with FEC stabilization as the as in the majority of IPA patients in this compassionate program setting where most patients were not treatment naive. They were already on perfenolone um, uh, already. Now, this is again a German study and nearly half the, of the patients in the German program already had received perfenidone and then went on to nitrodanib. And then the results again, uh, nearly out of the total patients that were on it in this program, 67% of the patients stabilized at the end of six months. It's a smaller uh, data that is available. Uh, but again, what it tells you in the real world clinical setting findings from these trials and show that nintadanib is effective for the management of IPF and is associated with disease stabilization, nintadanib remains generally well tolerated. Uh, this is something very interesting to uh, and was published in Lung India. This is an Indian patient experience. 20 patients of IPF were initiated on nintadanib, out of which 16, of course, were on perfenidone before starting nintadanib because that was the product. The mean duration of perfenidone before was nearly three years, and the most common this reason was, this, again, disease progression. And what was found is that FVC in a patient whom with PFT was available was stable with decrease of FVC by a mean of just around 40 ml at six months after starting nintadanib. The patients who uh, continue taking nintadanib, four felt symptomatically better, seven remained static. Again, not a bad news for 11 out of these 20 patients and only one worsened. So, six, I mean, uh, uh, of the 16 patients who had taken perfenidone before, 12 shared that they, of course, tolerated nintadanib better than perfenidone. Uh, I don't know which end of your gut you are going to be more comfortable with, maybe a personal choice, but I think getting some amount of loose motions, a mild diarrhea is much more preferable than a severe upper GI intolerance, which may be the problem with uh, uh, perfenidone. Uh, similar data coming from Greek, Greek compassionate use study and uh, usage study and uh, UK study. And I'm not going to go there because there are another two more databases, Italian as well as uh, US-based retrospective study. And all these are more or less telling you the same exam. Uh, hey, the, uh, presence of comorbidities at baseline did not appear to affect the safety and uh, pro efficacy profile of nintadanib. Concomitant medications at baseline largely had no significant effect on the nintadanib. And the that brings us to the last part where how are these two molecules? Two of them are available in perfenidone over a much longer time. Nintadanib available from 2014, but it has become realistically an option on one on one comparison. For most of our say, middle or higher middle class patients, uh, on a with a comparative co comparable price and a doses which is much much more user friendly of 150 milligram twice daily, uh, what would be uh, the the differentiators here? Of course, the crude indications are more. The US FDA approval for PFILD is also in place for nintadanib, whereas uh, perfenidone is only indicated in IPF at this point in time as per the guideline, as per the uh, approvals are considered. In the renal impairment, mild to moderate renal impairment, dosage modification is not required here in perfenidone. You have to use, you have to uh, use it with caution with mild, moderate, or severe renal impairment. And one of my patients with, I remember, uh, with a mild impairment had to just take 200 milligram twice daily uh, to be effective. I mean, thrice daily, sorry, uh, to be effective for that perfenidone. And she continued well with a creatinine of four and. Uh, um, and and, uh, and and a very good survival of four years. After diagnosing, biopsy documented diagnosis of um, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Uh, another very important thing which is which you have to take into consideration is the onset of action is faster with nintadanib. All the pivotal trials like impulse in build shown the FAC graph separation of that is efficacy from four to six weeks, whereas it takes both ascend as the pivotal trials like ascent and if I'm not trying to in, no, I'm not sure on that name of that trial. Uh, it takes about 12 weeks for it to separate. So that that is going to be an issue, particularly if you are using it in an indication like COVID-related fibrosis. If it is going to take three weeks, 
three months to start acting, we are not sure whether we are going to continue that particular agent for more than six months or not. It becomes a little more difficult to imagine whether we are going to use that or not. So, for uh, for Trendon versus nintendonip in the mind management of IUPF in the clinical practice, a total of 50 patients were included. Clinical functional radiological follow-up were done at baseline six months and 12 months of therapy. And what was seen, and this is something which I uh, is is that you can um, most of the times on perfect or on just a small number of them actually show regression on the follow up CT, and majority of them of course are stationary, and some of them will show progression. That seems to be definitely changing in when we are seeing nintadenib, a substantially larger number of patients with a statistically significant change. And this trial interests me, uh, interested me a lot because we believe that fibrosis once set in should not be reversing at all. And that is true for a large majority of these patients even here. But some substantial number of, a substantially higher number of patients in the nintadenib group have shown a regression in the fibrosis. And this is something which we have not really anticipated. Once again, if you look at it from the physiological points of view, the arterial blood gas seemed to be, the PO2 seemed to be better in the nintadenib group. Saturation was better in the nintadenib group. The FVC was better in the nintadenib group. And the and when 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 the starting points were similar, and we as we said, the regression of on, on the follow-up HRCT was statistically significant in these groups. The six-minute walk distance, which is a very important physiological parameter, also was uh, significantly better in the nitrate group. So I think this is something worth taking into consideration when we are comparing these two molecules. When they are on the equal pricing setting, their onset of action is faster with nitrate and the side effect profile is possibly more manageable or tolerable when it comes to between these two uh, agents. And of course, the patient preference also has to be taken into consideration because what side effect he comes across, we'll have to make accordingly the changes. So both perfendron and entendonib appear to stabilize the disease, which is typically associated with deterioration in clinical function radiologic parameters. Here, in this particular trial, they had observed that nintadenib actually had a lower tolerability and more, more serious age. That means their diarrhea profiles was worse than what was uh, what was the upper GI problems that their patients encountered. And therefore, the discontinuation rate was a little higher in the nintadenib group in this particular trial. But at the same time, ir irrespective of that, there was a change towards betterment in the nintadenib group. And uh, I leave you with these two guidelines. There's no question about uh, the fact that all symptomatic IPF patients with FPC of more than 50% predicted should be initiated on nintadenib. So that, that's a consistent statement coming from ICS and NCCB in 2020. And of course, 2011 and 2014 onwards, uh, recommendation suggests that clinicians use nintadenib and, uh, in patients with IPDF, conditional recommendation, moderate confidence, and this has kept on growing over the period of time. Um, with this. So I, I think with that, I'm not going to read that uh, because I've already touched upon all these aspects of the concluding remarks. So with that, thank you. And uh, thank you, Sanjeev. It's over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Nitin. Um, I think you have shed light on a very, very important aspect, which is on the role of this management of uh, Anything that is fibrosing. And of course, uh, what's very interesting is the fact that um, you were able to show what is a new paradigm in the management of these uh, cases. And very beautifully compared, because this is going to become very important, uh, nintadenib with perfenidone. I think we are the only country in the world that has both of the medicines at a very equivalent price. And now that doctors are going to be faced with equivalent pricing, uh, which is the drug you're going to choose? In my own experience, I think what I have done is switched pretty extensively to nintadenib. It is yeah. just so much easier mm -hmm. to take. It is just two tablets. You don't have to build up the dose over a long period of time. And I was uh, very impressed that you had the same experience that I have. We have over 100 patients on nintadenib in post-COVID fibrosis. And diarrhea does not seem to be a problem. Absolutely not. I don't I mean, know. I've not seen a that. single. 
I've not seen a yeah, single because, side effect. Yeah, because some of these patients actually had diarrhea as the presenting feature of the COVID, and still yeah. they did not have diarrhea related to nitrate. Of course, yes. that was one month later. Uh, there was no viral phase there. Absolutely. Yeah, but what I am doing, and I would like to have your thoughts. And this is something a little controversial because I think there's a question uh, in the uh, box here, chat box. What is the criteria to start antifibrotic drugs in COVID and post-COVID cases? And my comments on this is, and I've said this in previous seminars, is that I start them very early the on get-go because as has been generally believed and you alluded to that, uh, they don't remove fibrosis, but they prevent fibrosis from happening. Now, compared to IPF, which fibrosis develops over five years, here fibrosis, I mean, develops over five weeks. So if I'm going to really prevent the development of this, I think I should start it very early. And that is what I've started to do. I have a bias, but I think they seem to be working. Uh, in patients who I thought were going to be good. In fact, when I've used it late, when they've been transferred from other hospitals, I'm not getting that benefit versus the, actually the benefit in our own patients. Now, I don't know if it is steroids. I don't know if it is antifibrotics, but that's what I am doing. So if I have a patient who's doing good, there's no point in starting. But if this guy is desaturating below, say, 95, 94 and getting worse, rather than waiting for steroids, if they fail, then this, I start, kya farak padega, thodi mein band kar denge. This is my experience. Exactly. I don't know what you both feel, Dr. Arjun and I, Dr. Nitin. I would like to hear it from Dr. Arjun, but even I'm absolutely on the same page. I think, you know, because there is no point, you know, because I have seen some purist thinking that I have to document worsening for three months and then I'll start. But the, but the, and I mean, this is a disease which is very rapidly worsening. Come on. I mean, it's a matter of days that a patient reaches on a ventilator. He is not coming out. I have seen people struggle to come out, out of the oxygen or a high flow nasal cannula for a good two months. And, and if I'm not going to add an antifibrotic early on, it, of course, you are not going to do it in the first week, which is a viral disease week. Second week onwards, anytime you think there is a reasonable documentation of fibrosing disease, you, sh you should be adding fibrosis or there is an extensive disease which is likely to fibrosis also. I would extend, I would take that challenge and put the patient on it. I, I, I might be a fool. I can stop it. As long as the patient is not going to be harmed by it, I would rather give it. I can stop it if I find that the patient is dramatically better somewhere down the line. And I, I'll be very happy to be proved to be an idiot there rather than uh, miss the bus of using an antifibrotic in good time. Apart from using correct dosage of steroids. Arjun, what do you say? I absolutely agree with you, sir. I mean, the same, that is the same thing that we also do, persistent hypoxia. Or if there are um, there is the beginning of uh, traction bronchitis or reticulation uh, starter, you start on um, antifibrotic. Uh, what we use is an interdynamic. Earlier you start, the better, because uh, as uh, Dr. Abhankar has also told, it's no point in starting it three months down the lane when fibrosis has already set in. So identify the right person and then start it. So that is that. Dr. Samarjit, since this is the pandemic, uh, your thoughts and comments on the fibrotic aspect of uh, COVID lung disease. I mean, you've covered uh, fibrosing lung disease, but just tell us a little bit about, do you think you will be able to help us in saying the GGOs are gone and this is the time to get in? Uh, you have to unmute, Samarjit. So we uh, we we have seen some COVID fibrosis uh, for sure, but we are not uh, really guiding therapy or uh, I have not had much experience with trying to tell my pulmonology colleagues uh, when to go with antifibrotics. I have I really do not have much experience with that, but of course we have seen a lot of fibrosis, and there was some question about. Uh, uh, whether they are worse in patients who have had uh, plasma therapy, etc. But I, I really haven't had any kind of uh, solid, you know, numbers to kind of comment on that. Thank you. Okay, great. Because uh, that's something I think we are going to all have to look at. Because the largest group of patients we're going to see now are going to be post-COVID fibrosis. Uh, because just the sheer volume, you know, if one crore patients have it, which is the official number, 
and only 5% of them get fibrosis, the volume is going to be huge. So I think this is a challenge. And the next question, again, pertaining to this, um, uh, is duration of nitrogenic therapy in post-COVID fibrosis. And um, guys, I don't know. I'm at the moment shooting from the hip. I tell them it is going to be three months to start because, again, uh, the progressive fibrosis is not It's a one-time hit. So either I'm going to do it, I don't know what I should do. I'm doing uh, PFTs on all of them. And I'm doing kind of three monthly PFTs. And I'm just trying to see when they stabilize, maybe we'll stop it. But um, just off the top of your head, guys, do you have a thought? I'm saying three yeah, to six months. Yeah, yeah. I think the duration is right. Three to six months, maybe maximum nine months. I don't think we are going to see it beyond that period. Mostly not. Those who are requiring it very, you know, very strongly by then, and those who are remaining hypoxic, I think they have better candidates for. I mean, somebody who's on oxygen at the end of nine months is obviously a candidate for lung transplantation rather than anything else. But uh, uh, and uh, and not everybody can aff afford that in our, this country. That's a different ball game altogether. So we will be having some respiratory cripples left with us. But at the same time, if it is working, I think the, the if it works rapidly, if it is showing that kind of you know, actual change in the fibrosis, which is shown in some one of that trial related to IPF also, 7% showing versus 2%. So I think if I'm seeing improvement, what my strategy would be to use it stably for three months. After that, do a PFT because by then first three months, you give it whenever you are starting, maybe second week, third week. And after that, you start doing monthly just pyrometries or six and a six minute walk and see what kind of progression are we getting. And at the end of six months, take a call, depending on how rapidly they are getting better. So I think three to six months, the duration seems correct. We could differ in our strategies slightly here and there, but that's okay, I think. And but I am not foreseeing more than nine months of usage of this unless until they are going for a transplant. And then it then then I will probably add a perfect down also in, into yeah. that basket. Yes. <laughs> Arjun, I mean the whole thing is this disease is teaching us something new every day. Uh, this is one crazy disease. Every three months, we have new paradigms and new guidelines, and probably every month. And the way we've gone with convalescent plasma in one month, gone. Uh, remdesivir, now it's, it's not accepted, nearly now not accepted. <laughs> so, probably in three months, we will have learned a lot. Uh, but um, would you think three to six months, one year? What do you think? Give a quick vote. And because we, I think we're over time, we were supposed to end at 8 30, it is nine o'clock. Absolutely. I don't know if there are more people. So, uh, I, will, I will also take a call on that, sir. Three to six months. Three, give it for three months, reassess, and then uh, take it from there. Sabarji, do you think CT will have a role in guiding us to see? So, uh, that's what I was going to ask you, sir. That maybe uh, uh, HRCT could give you an idea about what is the kind of residual fibrosis still in the lungs. Is it totally gone? Is it a bit at the bases? Is it beside the periphery? Maybe you could take a call after looking at the CTs. And maybe the more we do, the more we learn. I, I'm sure. I'm sure we'll have another conference, another webinar on something like this. And I'll, uh, I'll tell you, Sanjeev, I, I had a COVID pneumonia. And then I had a COVID-related fibrosis also, which happened within three weeks. So three weeks CT was worse yeah. with serpentine fibrotic lines. Correct. And five weeks, five weeks it was gone. And I was not on anything for, for except steroid, nothing else. So I think a large part of that job could be actually be done or maybe being done by uh, by the steroids alone and the time or, uh, and, and the healing by itself. But I still would take that benefit of doubt to the minted and if, whether it is giving an additional benefit or not till that is proved or disproved. So I think till the next uh, data comes on this with a robust trial, I'm going to use it for some time, definitely. I completely agree. I think the greater benefit is the early steroids, which are making yeah. a big difference. But why would I not give a relatively reasonably priced drug, which is so safe, very Absolutely. near side effect and may have benefit yeah. until till better uh, data comes to us. Okay, I've got a couple of questions. Again, I'm, I don't know. I have no input from the organizers when to stop, but it's okay. Can we give, so one question is, can we give perfinidone and nintidinib together for better effect? Mm, I don't think so. I think one drug at a time is a better idea because you have equally efficacious drugs. So you, are, you will add it only when you become desperate. This is where I will wait. 
this is where i'll be i would wait yeah, i would put to really to. qualify for it in the true yeah. sense i mean i think that also because then you got adding two tablets yeah. of nintendo and 24 mg 200 and 2400 mg of perfenadone and building it up i think we're going to get into side effects i'm going to and, also and you are hitting both upper and lower gi with bad side effects with bad side effects i think patient chhod dega apne ko apart <laughs> okay so one quick question arjun uh, your thing can post covid fibrosis get converted to ipf i don't know so only time will tell Yeah, I don't. I don't yeah, think so. I don't, I think, don't so. think so. I don't think so. Okay, last question or maybe um, last question. Get going to IPF or not? Okay, so this is just um, an elder's guidance to the patients, and there is a comment from somebody who said that COVID pneumonia patients feel very happy at a saturation of ninety two, ninety three. uh should we not force them to take oxygen more than they are taking so arjun what are you going to tell them aap jo bologe uh so what i have understood is that a patient with covid has a saturation of 92% Yeah, patient is got ninety two. He is not worried He's about taking oxygen. He is a happy oxygen. hypoxic patient. He is probably then, course, happy hypoxic. Have, yeah, absolutely. We'll start oxygen for that patient and uh, maybe it extra nine from disabled as well. Nitin, you agree? We all agree on this yeah. very agreeable note. I can see Sachin has come back to take yeah. the mic from all of us, and uh, I invite Sachin to kind of wrap up the whole thing. And thank you all. Thank you, uh, Arjun. That was wonderful. Uh, the whole diagnostic algorithm, Doctor Samajit. And the city images were brilliant. Absolutely, I, yeah. I, I just love them. Thank I love you. them. So Samajit, excellent. You know, my only comment on that: all these wonderful images you guys from CT scan present, you no, know, only in conferences. In the day-to-day -day practice, we get this horrible. सी टी स्कैन टू लुक एट तीन फोटो है ऊपर की तीन फोटो है नीचे की एंड वी कैन नॉट मेक आउट एनी थिंग आउट आई जस्ट होप यू कीप गिविंग दो वंडरफुल इमेजेस ऑन डे टू डे प्रैक्टिस एंड नितिन ऑफकोर्स फैंटेस्टिक कवरेज ऑफ एवरी थिंग इट्स ऑलवेज अ प्लेजर टू सी यू प्लेजर टू सी ऑल ऑफ यू थैंक यू ऑल थैंक द ऑडियंस एंड थैंक लुपिन फॉर अरेंजिंग दिस वंडरफुल टाइम थैंक यू ऑल एंड आई एम हैंड दिस टू सचिन टू रैप इट अप डॉक्टर सचिन ऑल यू Uh, thank you, thank you very much, sir. So, on behalf of Lupin, let me conclude by saying a big thank you to all our esteemed faculty, Dr. Sanjay Mehta, sir, for excellent moderations, Dr. Nitin Ambedkar, sir, Dr. Arjun, sir, Dr. Samarajit, sir. So, this is a, a very enlightening and enriching sessions for all the participant uh, of today's webinar. Uh, so, <clears throat> with respect to the time, uh, a big thank you to all, and uh, those who join later, they can, uh, they can. go and live see the live streaming on lupin india facebook page